did college, I had an opportunity to work with an HIV positive population that was just when AIDS was coming out. And during that time, I had the chance to um, work with some really young girls, 11, 12 years old, to held a lot of sweet hands while they were dying. And um, I don't think that ever left me. I was on staff um, in Women's Mysteries for nearly nine years when I just started feeling like I was, um, God was making me restless, pouring over scripture and it was um, just breaking my heart in new ways. And I would come across these passages and I would just, they would make me weep because I really um, was struck with, do I do this? Do I live this way? Do I feed the hungry? Do I clothe the naked? Do I visit the prisoner? Do I take in the homeless? Like, do, what do, do I, how do I do these things? So I had this idea that uh, I wanted to work with women who had been rescued from sex trafficking. Naomi's house opened in December of 2016, and they were hiring for a direct care position, and I had had a background in social services and a background in ministry. These really blended the two of those things. I was asked to co-lead the weekly Bible study here. I was a little nervous, but I thought what a privilege that would be to get to spend time with these women and open God's word with them. And so shortly after the house opened, I began serving in that capacity, coming here to spend time, hear a little bit of the women's stories, and just point to, to the many ways that we could find in scripture where the Lord saw and cared for women. When I first started working at Naomi's house, I had this opportunity to give a woman a tour and she couldn't stop crying the whole time. She came in, she took one look around at this beautiful place and she just started crying. I'm used to that. I knew that women come here and it's the most beautiful place I've ever lived. I can't, you know, started apologizing for crying. And I said, it's okay, it's okay, okay? That's, it's a lot, it's a lot to take in. And she said, do you think I could have a hug? And I said, oh, sweetheart, of course, of course you can have a hug. And so I hugged her and she just sobbed in my arms. Um, and she said, I can't remember the last time I was hugged. And I thought, here's a woman who's touched 24 hours a day, practically, in ugly, ugly ways and beaten and broken she hadn't had someone hold her in a way that was caring in years, years. It's beautiful to see the transformation that comes. I got to see a woman attend church and have her mom join her at church for the first time and have that, that, that mom witness and see her daughter worshiping the Lord and singing a song that talks about coming up out of the grave and seeing this mom witness that her daughter really has been brought back to life. I've come to see that I'm not very different from these ladies. They're precious and they're brave and in their brokenness, I see my own. And through interacting with them, coming to know them, my hope is just getting bigger as I see the work that the Lord is doing in them. When their eyes are opened, when they're, they come back to life, when they start dreaming and planning for their futures, I just think, oh, there's no situation. There's no person on this earth where God can't bring healing. That's a powerful short video about just one of the ways that Chapel Street has been involved over recent years with some of the broken people of our world. Uh, you may not be aware of this, but um, 
Chapel Street, through your generosity, uh, helped purchase that home. I remember being there when it was just a broken down property with Pastor Bruce and some others a few years ago. And we were one of the churches that got, got, came alongside and tried to help purchase that. And now we have two of our own serving there, helping lead that ministry. It's just a great story of what God is doing with that group of people. Well, my very first sports hero was a baseball player named Rocky Calavito. And if you're old enough to remember Rocky, any sports fans, you've got to be kind of a baseball nut to, to know who he was. But when I was about five years old, our family moved from Louisville, Kentucky, where I was born, up to Akron, Ohio, where my dad had taken a new church. And so uh, the first sports teams I started to pay attention to were naturally Cleveland teams, the Cleveland Browns and the Cleveland Indians. And Rocky Calavito had been the star player of the Indians in the late 60s and on into, in late 50s and on into part of the 60s. He was a guy who at one time um, hit four consecutive home runs in one game. It's a record that still stands, although others have, have tied it uh, by this point. But he was wildly popular with fans and with us as little boys. Uh, he, and he was po- known for a very unique routine he went through every time he came to bat. I mean, some people were afraid when I brought this to church, but I'm just demonstrating. <laughs> he would uh, get up to bat and he would always do the same things. He would stretch his neck, kind of take his time. Then he would put the bat behind his shoulders and kind of flex uh, he was bigger than me. I'm not that intimidating when I flex, but he would flex. And then when he got the bat, he would point the bat and hold it like right at the pitcher's face. He would point it, and it was very menacing. But when we were young boys, like six or seven years old, the, the, the buddies in the neighborhood, we, we just worshipped Rocky, and we wanted to be like Rocky. So we were out there in our yard with our little plastic bats practicing exactly the way he would do it, exactly the way he would come to bat. We wanted to imitate him. And to this day, one of my prized possessions is this bat right here, which is a, an official Hilberts and Bradsby Louisville Slugger Rocky Calavito model, which I found at a garage sale like 20 years ago and bought it, and I've had it in my office ever since. I don't think it's actually his bat, but I like to think it was. But we wanted to imitate him, and in that sense, we sort of followed him. And we're in the second week of a series right now that we're calling Won't You Love Your Neighbor? And we began last week by looking at the command to love your neighbor. Remember, we were back in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus is approached by an expert in religious law who tested him with a question. He said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered, knowing it was a test, by asking his own question. He said, uh, what does the law say? How do you read it? And the man then quotes from the Torah, uh, the books of the law, what we call the Old Testament, book of Deuteronomy and the book of Leviticus. And he says, love the Lord your God. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus then says, you have answered correctly. Do this and live. And last week we saw that when Jesus said that, he was affirming those two commands, love God and love your neighbor, as commands that summarized the entirety of God's law. The Ten Commandments and all that God regarded as uh, important that he cared about most. Love God, love your neighbor. Now, he was also challenging this man's sort of self-righteous hypocrisy because no one, not even an expert in the law, keeps the law perfectly. Because the law of God does not say the law convicts and leads us to confession and repentance, leads us to our need for the grace of Christ. But we did start with the clear command. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God by loving your neighbor. Now, today we move on to talk about the call to love your neighbor. We're going to go back a bit, a few chapters in Luke's gospel to Luke chapter 5. I'm going to read for you three different stories in the same chapter, and I'll explain why as we go through. But Luke chapter 5 starts with a miracle. It starts with a miraculous catch of fish. Three Galilean fishermen, Peter, James, and John, are um, out fishing uh, all night one night. They come back and they've caught nothing. Uh, Jesus then uses their boat to teach for a while, and after he teaches, he says, hey, guys, take the boat back out to the deep water and try again. And Peter says, well, because you said so, we'll do it. Uh, And they go out, and they catch literally a boatload of fish, enough to almost sink their boat. They come back in, and Peter is terrified by what's happened because he knows it's a miracle. He knows that Jesus now has the authority and power to do that. So he says, get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. And then Jesus says in, Matthew, in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Then Jesus said to Simon, which is another name for Peter, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. 
Um, first thing I want to point out here is just a small thing that we can miss unless we know something about ancient Jewish culture. When Jesus called Simon Peter and the others to leave their nets and follow him, he was sort of breaking all rabbinical protocol of the time. Because in that day and time, what would ha- the way it usually happened was a young man uh, would, uh, in his early teens or mid-teens, would study really hard and prepare really hard and then pick a rabbi that he wanted the opportunity to follow. And he would, he would offer himself to the rabbi, can I please, could I please become your follower? And the rabbi then would consider whether or not he thought this young man had what it took to be his follower. Jesus doesn't do it that way. He doesn't wait for these guys to come after him and beg. He goes after them and he calls them to follow him just as he calls us to follow him. Now follow is an interesting word. I think we hear it so often in a spiritual context that sometimes we don't really uh, remember what it actually means. Um, The Greek word used here means to follow, but also it means to conform wholly to the example of another. To conform to the example of another. So when Jesus calls Peter, James, and John to follow him, he's saying, I want you to be like me. I want you to be like me. I want you to go where I go. So the question is, what's Jesus like? Where does he go? And then Luke starts telling stories. Here's the first story he tells. The very next verse, verse 12, chapter 5. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. Now, leprosy has been eradicated from our world today, pretty much. But leprosy was a hideous and feared disease in that time. Uh, lepers were sent to live in colonies. Uh, they were separated from their families, from their communities. They were viewed as cursed by God. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. So Jesus encounters a man covered in leprosy. The culture of the time said avoid such a man. Get as far away from him as possible. The religious law of the day said the leprous man was unclean, spiritually speaking, cursed, He wasn't allowed to worship at the temple. And if he came into your home, he would contaminate your whole home with his uncleanness. But Jesus does something different, Luke says. He ignores the cultural rules. He ignores the religious rules of the time. And he touches the untouchable man. And look what happens. Jesus makes him clean. So Jesus is not contaminated by his uncleanness. Rather, the man is contaminated by Jesus' cleanness. He heals the man. Then Luke moves on immediately to another story. The very next verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat, threw threw the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. So, My guess is uh, most of you are familiar with this story at least a little bit. It's a Sunday school favorite because it's so visual and so dramatic. Um, Jesus is teaching in someone's home. We don't know whose home. The person isn't named. Probably teaching on his favorite subject, the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God like? What's it mean to live in the kingdom of God? Who's invited to participate in the kingdom of God? And the religious leaders are there to hear him. Maybe they're curious. Much more likely they're listening, trying to uh, discredit him eventually. Luke, who was a doctor, a physician, uh, we know, uh, tells us that the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. And Luke was particularly interested in healing because he was a doctor. Now some friends bring a paralyzed man to Jesus. We don't know what his issue was, but he was lying on a mat. 
And because the crowd is so great, they scramble up out into the, the roof of this home and they tear apart enough of the ceiling tiles, however the home was made, and drop this man down right in front of Jesus. Now I want to pause there. Uh, there's something kind of crazy and funny and touching about this part of the story. It's really a kind of a crazy thing to do when you think about it. If you try to put that in our culture, it's a really crazy thing. I mean, who's going to pay for that damage, right? But here's what's beautiful about it. These friends who are not named, we don't know their names, cared on the one hand so much for their friend, and on the other hand had so much faith that Jesus could do something for their friend that they, they did that. They, they climbed up and they dropped him down. And I wonder if I've ever been a friend like that to someone. Have you ever been a friend like that to someone? Do you have a friend like that? Who sees you like that and sees Jesus like that. There's a beautiful part of the story about faith and friendship. So Jesus takes one look at this guy in the mat and then does the unexpected and the unthinkable. He says, your sins are forgiven. And you can almost hear the gasp in the room. People like, what? What? What did he say? It sounded like he said he forgave him. What's he talking about? Who does he think he is? The man's paralyzed. Can he do something else for him? causes confusion and outrage because only God can forgive sins. The Pharisees were exactly right. Only God can do that. Who do you think you are? It meant Jesus was claiming himself to be equal to God. And then, to prove that he had the authority, he does the impossible. He tells the man to get up and walk, and he does. And then Luke moves straight on to a third story. Back to back to back. Third story, uh, beginning in verse... Oops, hang on a second. 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. This is the same guy as Matthew. It's a different name. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. There's that word follow again. Then Levi held a great banquet. The word for banquet there uh, means uh, reception or feast. Uh, We can think party. Uh, Through a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We're going to look at this particular story a little bit more in a couple of weeks as we wrap up the series. But I want you to just notice several things for today. First, notice that Luke tells us Levi is a tax collector. This is Matthew. Most of you are aware that tax collectors in that day uh, were the lowest of the low. These were Jewish men who were extorting money from their own people to give to the Romans. So they were, they were hated and despised. They were seen as dishonest and greedy and traitors to their own people. So they couldn't hang out with everybody else because they were seen as unclean. Nobody wanted to be with them except other tax collectors. That's the first thing you notice. The second thing you notice is that Levi, is Matthew, is still sitting at his tax collector's booth when Jesus calls him. Now, I have taught this passage many, many times over the years, and I never noticed this little thing before. I don't know why. I never noticed it until this time. He's still at the tax collector's booth. Matthew, he's still doing the thing that made him despised. Jesus hasn't waited for him to clean his act up. He hasn't said, well, once you, once you get away from that business for a while, then we can talk about you following me. No, he goes right to him while he's still doing that thing and calls him. Now, to say Matthew wasn't a, a good candidate for discipleship is, is a vast understatement. This would be like hiring a member of the Chicago Mafia to work in your accounting department at your business. It makes no sense. Yet Jesus calls, and Levi follows. Third thing we notice is that Levi, the first thing he does is he throws a party in Jesus' honor at his home, and the only people he could even invite who'd be willing to come were other people like him, other tax collectors and sinners. Now, why would Matthew do this? Because he wanted all his friends to meet Jesus too. So what do we make of all these stories? Three in a row. Luke tells us that when Jesus calls Peter, James, and John to follow him, he tells them, no longer will you fish for fish. You're going to fish for people. And then Luke takes us straight away to three stories. A leper, a paralyzed man, and a tax collector. Now, it seems to me there are three approaches we could take to understand these, this cluster of three stories. First, we could read these three stories to see what they have to teach us about Jesus and who he is. And there's plenty. 
These three stories taken together tell us that Jesus is who he said he was. He's got the authority to heal. He's got the power to cleanse. He's got the power to, to forgive sins. He's got the power to give new life. He is who he says he is, the incarnation of God Almighty. Second, we could read these stories, all three of them lumped together, to see what they teach us about uh, the people that Jesus was t- ministering to. What does it mean to be unclean? What does it mean to be paralyzed physically or spiritually? What does it mean to be a despised tax collector and to be far from God? And there would be plenty to talk about there because everyone in this room at one time or another was in one of those categories. Or thirdly, and this is how I want to look at it today, we can look at these three stories together that Luke puts in this place at this time to see what Jesus is teaching his disciples about what it means to follow That's the way I want to look at it today. And the first thing I see is that Jesus is teaching us that following Jesus is not an intellectual exercise. Following him is not an intellectual exercise. Uh, My wife, Lorene, who's here today with three of our boys, um, she and I like to ride our bikes, especially during the summer, early fall. We ride our bikes on Saturday morning, usually down by the river on one of the trails there. And when we ride our bikes, uh, she rides in front and I ride behind, and that allows her to sort of set the pace of our riding. Um, but let's say one day uh, we went out to ride, and I said, hey, follow me, and I jumped on my bike. If I said that and did that, I don't think she would assume that I intended for her to go back inside and maybe think about how I was going to ride the bike. I wouldn't expect her, she wouldn't think I was telling her to go to the library and read a book about riding a bike, or that she would uh, write a paper about the philosophy of bike riding. She would assume that I knew where I was going, that I had an idea, and I wanted her to literally get on her bike and follow me. And she would follow. At least I I think she probably would. Here's the point. Faith, discipleship, following Jesus is not just an intellectual exercise. Faith in Jesus is not just believing right things about Jesus. It's following Jesus. Faith is going where Jesus goes. Now what does that mean? Well, it does mean believing certain things. It means believing Jesus is the Son of God who has the authority to forgive sin, who has the power to grant new life. It also means leaving. He called these men to leave their nets. He calls us to leave behind lesser things, things on which we had once pinned our identity, things on which we had once invested our hope, things that we had once depended on to give us salvation. Leave those things behind. But mostly it means living in the manner and direction of Jesus. James, in the second chapter of his letter in the New Testament, wrote, and I don't have this on the screen, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith is dynamic and active. Faith goes somewhere. Faith goes where Jesus goes. Faith follows Jesus. That's the first thing. Second thing I see in these three stories clumped together is that following Jesus is not always comfortable. It's not always comfortable. When I was in seminary years ago, I was required to complete a a requirement for graduation called clinical pastoral education, CPE for short. And so I was, I had to, uh, I had to go to a large suburban hospital and become a student chaplain for one semester. And so I, three days a week, I would report to the hospital, and they sent me to a wing. And the wing I was assigned that whole semester was an oncology wing. Now, I, was, I, I had no experience in hospitals. I had never been around people who were struggling with cancer before. So I, I, was, I felt unprepared, inadequate. I, I, I was very uncomfortable just doing that as a student chaplain. And uh, early on, at one point in my time there, um, I reported to the floor. The head nurse said, hey, you need to go visit the man in... I forget the room number, 201, let's say. Go visit that man. So I walk in. Nobody else is in the room. There's a man lying on a bed. I now know what I was looking at. Then I didn't. He was in his late 70s, looked like, very gaunt. Skin had this ashen color to it. Uh, Now I know that he was, now I would have recognized he was very near death, death. Then I didn't know. So I walked in. He looked up at me. And as soon as he saw me, he blurted out loudly, surprisingly, he said, who the blank are you? took me by surprise a little bit, and I started to stammer out my, um, I'm a, I'm a um, student chaplain, I'm here to, and he interrupted me once he heard the word chaplain. 
And then he said back equally forcefully, I don't need a blankety-blank chaplain. And he cursed at me. And I stopped dead in my tracks, and I just went, okay. And I backed out of the room. Uh, but later that day, I kept thinking about that man. The next, I thought about that man. I kept thinking about it like, I wish I hadn't left. Man, I should have done something differently. What could I have done differently? So I made up my mind the next time I went, two days later, I was going to go straight to that room again and try again. So I, two days later, I went to the hospital, got, went to the floor, and walked straight to room 201, and the bed was empty. So I went to the nurse and said, where would you move the guy who was in 201? She goes, oh, he died yesterday. And I realized I'd missed my chance because it was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. When Jesus says, follow me, notice where he goes. He doesn't go to church. Now, I know the church didn't exist then, but he didn't go to the temple. He didn't go to a synagogue. Uh, now, we know he did regularly go to those places. He went to the temple to worship. He taught in synagogues. But right after he called these guys to follow him, that's not where he went. These stories don't happen in the temple. They don't happen in a synagogue. The first happens on the street. The second happens in a home. The third happens in a party. He's not in a whole church full of people like him. He's not hanging out with the good people. He's out in the community. He's going to the broken places of the world. He's going to the broken people of the world. And that's the third thing I see in these three stories, that following Jesus means moving toward broken people. Moving toward broken people. During that same semester when I was um, doing my CPE work at the hospital, I also had another class. And the other class I had was on evangelism. And the young professor who taught that class uh, did not believe evangelism was just something to read about and study about. He actually believed it was something to, to do. So one day our assignment was, uh, he took us all and put us in a van and drove us down to Chicago, into a random neighborhood in Chicago. There's like eight of us in, in, in this class. And he dropped us off and he said, you have four hours. And four hours I'm going to be right here at this corner picking you up to take you back home. And in those four hours you have to find someone that you can share the good news of the gospel with. Talk about out of my comfort zone. I, I, was, I, I wasn't a city guy, number one. Uh, I'm sort of a suburban guy. Number two, I, I'm comfortable talking about spiritual things with people when I have sort of a relationship with them, a reason to talk to them. But just a random person who I don't know, out of my comfort zone. So I walked around, I walked up and down this random Chicago street for like an hour, uh, thinking, what am I going to do? I got this requirement. I got to do this. How am I going to do this? And I, I was just hoping and praying that someone would walk up to me and say, hey, hey, can you explain this Jesus thing to me? <laughs> and nobody did that. So after about an hour, I noticed this older gentleman who was sitting on the sidewalk, leaning back against the wall, wearing what looked like a tattered suit and a, a, a hat, the kind of hat that a, a man would wear like back in the 50s. He looked like to me, maybe, maybe he might be homeless. And I happened to notice, too, there was a McDonald's right across the street. So I, saw, I thought, well, maybe this is my guy. So I walked up to him and I said, hey, um, I'm going to go over to the McDonald's and get a bite to eat. You want to you join me? And he would look kind of surprised and he said, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. And, and he, I, we, so we walked across the street, walked into McDonald's, ordered a couple of burgers and we sat there. Found out his name was John. He was in his late 60s probably. Uh, eventually I asked him about his story and he told me a long story, a sad story. About one time having a family, having a job. But one thing led to another, and everything fell apart, and he wound up on the street. And then he asked me about me. That surprised me. Uh, and I told him, I'm, I'm a seminary student, trying to figure out what, what God wants to do with my life. Uh, he said, oh, I grew up in church, but I haven't been here in a long time. And he told me he drifted, drifted pretty far away from God. And so then I did the best I could, you know. I don't remember exactly what I said, but told him that Jesus knew him and loved him and offered him forgiveness and healing and hope. We talked for like an hour or so. And then time came for me to leave and we finished up. And as we were leaving the restaurant, just as walked out on the sidewalk, he goes, hey man, hey, I, he goes, I got to tell you something. He said, I'm, I'm a wino. That was his, his word, I'm a wino. And I could really use a drink, he said. And I knew I had $5 in my pocket. And so I took it out. And I gave it to him, and I said, John, I, I hope you won't use this to, to buy a drink, but it's yours. And he got tears in his eyes, and he said, thanks. And then he said, someday you're going to be a heck of a priest, he said. <laughs> Only he didn't say heck of a. He said, <laughs> and I hope I'll see John in heaven someday. I don't know. But if I do, I'm going to thank him. because He was one of the people God used to help clarify the direction of my life.
that one conversation. Jesus calls his disciples to follow him in moving toward the unclean, a leper, the hopeless, a paralyzed man, and the despised and far from God, a tax collector. Why? Why does Luke put these in that order? Well, remember the great commandments? Love God, love your neighbors yourself. We move toward broken people because that's what it means to love God. We move toward broken people because that's where Jesus goes. So who are the broken people? Well, they're the women that we saw talked about on the video, people at Naomi's house, yes. But also, they can be our neighbors sometimes. Just a few few weeks ago, Lorena and I were sitting on the porch of our house right in our neighborhood. Beautiful summer afternoon, late late in the afternoon, just sitting there. And a neighborhood woman from the cul-de-sac right down the street from us comes walking by, walking her dog. And Lorene goes, oh, that's Christine. I haven't seen her for a while. She hollers out to her from the porch, hey, how's your summer been? And the woman says, well, okay. But the way she said it, we knew things weren't okay. At least my wife picked that up. I don't know if I did or not. But she picked it up. And she, she said, well, did you send your daughter off to school? Thinking that was it. And she said, yeah, well, yeah. Actually, my mom had a stroke last Sunday, and she died on Tuesday. Now, Lorene lost her mom a little over a year ago. So she jumped out of her chair, walked out across our front yard, and just embraced this woman on our sidewalk, just like that. And for 10 minutes, they had a conversation about grief, and she let her talk about her mom. Sometimes the broken person lives right next door. Sometimes the broken person is someone we work with (coughs) or someone we go to school with. These are the people who ring up our groceries at the supermarket. These are the people who make our specialty drinks at the coffee shop. These are the people that we look at and think, "Mm, there's no way. Not in a million years that person's interested in Jesus. These are the broken people. If I could go back to my clinical pastoral education experience, if I could go back to that hospital on that day when I walked into that room and that man cursed at me saying, I don't need a bleeping chaplain. I don't think I would have let his bluster scare me off. I don't think I would have. I don't think I would have backed out of the room, scared and uncomfortable. I think I would have stayed. I think I would have recognized that his words are, were not spoken at me, about me. They were spoken out of a place of great fear and pain in his own life. So no, I wouldn't have left the room. I think I would have moved toward him, toward the man lying in the bed. Maybe I would have stood next to him in bed and just let him curse till he was tired of cursing at me. I don't know. Maybe I would have noticed a military tattoo or something and started a conversation that he could engage in. Maybe I would have just pulled up a chair and sat down and waited for him to calm down. And at some point I would have said, hey, can I pray for you? Would it be okay if I prayed for you? And all the years from that day till now, hundreds of times, I've asked that question. I've never once had someone say no. Never once. That would be my question. And if he said yes, I'd say And here's what I'd like to pray. I'd like to pray that you would open your heart to the love of Jesus. And you would allow him to fill your heart with his forgiveness and grace and give you the great promise of everlasting life. Can I pray that for you? I've also asked that question. And people say, yes. And I would have prayed. But I would not have left. Because that man did need a chaplain. I knew it, and he knew it. And that's where Jesus would have gone. And that's what Jesus would have done. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your call to follow. And for these three beautiful little stories that Luke shares with us. That show us how you see people. That show us how you move toward the broken. How you loved, forgave, healed, touched. And how these stories teach us what it means, what it looks like to follow you. And what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. We pray these things in your name.